Okay. I threw this thing together this morning. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I had ideas cooking in my brain all week, but uh, I had to actually sit down and, and do this thing. So, and in fact, we're not going to start this thing without my coffee. So hang on. Luckily, it's near hand. Okay. Today, we're going to talk about double attacks. Um, I realized through the teaching of these lectures that I wanted to go back and address some tactical fundamentals. Um, I am going to scale those fundamentals fairly quickly so that we can look at some more advanced things and you can get a sense. Um, I also think that some of the things I'm going to talk about will appeal even to intermediate and advanced players because we're going to talk a little bit about um, what are sometimes called search strategies, right? In other words, not just solving puzzles, which we're going to do quite a bit of today. We're going to solve quite a few tactical puzzles. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, encourage people to, to not answer too many in a row so that I can force all of you to participate. Um, but also, we want to look at how the puzzles you know, come to be. Like, what, what are the tactical mistakes that the players are making that lead to them getting got? So uh, without, I think, further ado, let's get rolling. So the first thing that I want to talk about here, I just got to get rid of my little list of people here. If you can get out of the way for me, that would be ever so useful. Hmm. Okay. Um, is just, you know, why it's so important in chess to always be trying to do more than one thing, right? So this is very typically when I'm teaching about double attacks and introducing this concept, I will set this position up on the board with just one queen and one rook and ask the student to win my rook, right? I will not waste too much of everyone's time here, but you know, it's pretty obvious after two or three turns, right? Sometimes the student takes a little while to get it, especially if they're younger, right? But it can't be done. Every time that the queen moves out to attack, the rook moves away, right? And the point is not just this simple exercise, but to demonstrate a concept that I think is really important, which is if you're only making one threat or only doing one good thing during a chess game, you're probably not doing enough, right? So um, this concept of double attack is kind of only the very beginning of a much larger concept, which comes into play in the end game and which we will not get into too much here today, but is very important, which is called the principle of two weaknesses, right? If you can open up a second front and create a second set of problems for your opponent, a lot of the time that will be enough to win, where if you only create a single problem and a single weakness, it isn't, right? So we're gonna look at that today. Okay, so one of the things I wanna talk about is what is a weakness, what does this kind of first weakness look like? Well, um, we're very fond of a particular saying in chess, uh, which is loose pieces drop off or loose pieces fall off, right? So what does this mean? Well. A loose piece is pretty easy to understand, right? It's defined as a piece which is not protected anywhere on the board, right? The rooks actually at the start of the game are loose pieces. We're not going to be getting into that too much today, but it's worth noting, right? So any time your opponent has loose pieces around the board, you have an opportunity to create an attack and force them to respond. Okay, and the second most common target, one with which most of you should be familiar, is as you see in the diagram, the king, right? The king is always going to be a point of vulnerability because when the king is attacked, you have to move it. So we get simple patterns like this, right? We have a loose rook on a5, we have the king on h8. Brian, why don't you lead us off? <laughs> what does white play here? Queen d8. Thank you. Queen to d8. Okay, we hit the king, we pick up the loose rook. Easy enough to understand. Okay, um, I'm actually, by the way, on this note, I wanna share with all of you this incredibly useful drill that I'm a big fan of. Um, if you 
I, I'm uh, especially a big fan of this before tournament games. We're not playing a lot over the board right now unless you're playing with a family member, obviously. But I find this to be kind of useful to get my head into the right space right before I start playing. I actually will set up the king on the center of the board and kind of uh, put a rook on the board with him and just kind of move the rook in concentric circles out from the king. And then by holding the queen in your hand, you can kind of put the queen down on squares where you could win it. So maybe that explanation wasn't totally clear. So uh, for example, right, if I have the king and the rook um, on these two particular squares, right, as I've moved around in my concentric circle, rather than moving the queen, I would just look at the board and place the queen down on all the squares where you can win a piece, right? So in this particular position, uh, there are three. Does anybody want to give me one of them? Where could the queen be? Again, remember, you can move anywhere you want. Where can we win a piece here? D7. D7? Absolutely. Four, anybody got another one? F5. 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 And? D1. Hmm. You got the dud. Oh. Okay. I'm, I'm very glad that somebody said that. <laughs> right? So one of the things that this will teach you is sometimes there are defensive tactics as well. Right? And the problem is, actually, I have a rough demonstration of this exact idea. Right? I was, I was hoping for this. Okay. In this kind of position, right, the queen um, cannot actually win a piece. The rook is a little bit too close to the king. Right? But there's also this problem that you want to be aware of, that if, for example, queen to d2, right, black has an easy move to save both the king and the rook. Okay? These, these little relationships of when this double attack works and does not work exist in different forms for every single piece. Right? So uh, to go back to our drill, right, queen to d1 would lead to rook to d4. Queen to f3 would lead to rook to e4, right, with the same idea, right? Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. pinned, but I didn't lose material. Um, so I love this drill. I'm a big fan of it, right? It's an easy thing to do by yourself to just kind of, as I said, warm your brain up a little bit <laughs> before a game. Um, I find that uh, working on actual tactics books when I'm sitting in a tournament hall, I get a little too nervous and I can't concentrate. So this is just a sort of simple drill to get my head into the right space. Um, and you can make this even more interesting as it starts to get stale and you feel like you've learned the patterns. Um, you can either move the king to different parts of the board or swap the rook out, right? If the rook is a knight or the rook is a bishop, suddenly all the things that used to work, right? For example, uh, we said that queen to d7 was a right move. Well, if this was a bishop, now queen to d7 doesn't work, but queen to g8 does, right? So these are sort of little things that you can do um, to help you get into the mode of picking up loose pieces and, and learning what the patterns are, right? Without um, yeah. necessarily just going through a puzzle book, which is obviously good as well. Okay, so all right. Theory done, theory crafty, over, right? Let's, uh, this one should be actually be familiar. It's a pattern we've already looked at with, uh, with just more pieces on the board. Hey, Brian, you want to yeah. unmute yourself and uh, give this a shot? Uh, queen to d8 again. I just realized we have two Brian's. I'm going to have to be clearer. Okay, but thank you, Brian Curry. <laughs> Appreciate it. Right, so yeah, queen to d8, right? Picking up the loose rook. Okay. But what about, what about this one? So for starters, um, and so to sort of bring everyone along with us, I think it might be of benefit to also say, before you sing out the answer, to say what is the loose piece, right? All of these are in this same category of the king and a loose piece. So where is the target? And then where is the move? Uh, Dave, Morrissey. D4, queen. Where's the target? Uh, the target is the rook and the queen. 
So the rook on a7 is the loose piece, right? Yep. Yeah. You're, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We're learning, right? I, uh, I don't usually force participation either, so forgive me. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I wanted to do things a little differently today um, because I'm doing something that I felt everyone could participate in, right? It's not quite as, um, quite as advanced, so it gives me license to be a pain in all of your butts. Okay, so yeah, the rook on a7 is loose. The king is exposed. Queen to d4. And we pick up, a, uh, pick up a rook, actually, better than a piece, right? Um, typically, in chess, when we say wins a piece, by the way, this is sort of a slang thing, we usually mean by wins a piece uh, a bishop or a knight, right? If we win a rook, we usually say win a rook, for whatever reason. This is the way it is. Also, pawns are not pieces. They're pawns, right? Welcome to my strange little uh, community. Okay. John, there's <laughs> a one. question. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Oh, Brian. I'm sorry. I thought you said you had a question. Brian was raising his hand. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the last one, uh, would you p take the rook immediately or would, um, or would you play the uh, rook e8 first? So in this, in this situation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So maybe you're saying like after king to h7, could we threaten checkmate? Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Do no, I have a way out of that? Hmm. Hmm. I'm kind of busted no matter what. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a nice little extra feature. Yeah, I, uh, I think I'm kind of busted no matter what. So yeah, this is probably a nice, a nice extra detail. I like that. So um, for anybody who's missing it, right, we have made and won, which means that even though we've given Black another move to stay alive, Right, he still doesn't have time to save his rook. Yeah, that's pretty pretty nifty. I like that a lot. Yeah, I think uh, that might even be a stronger move. That might even be a stronger move than... Um, but, uh, you know, now, now it occurs to me, I guess I could play queen f6, right? And that would prevent you from being able to play that idea. But still, obviously, the piece is lost, right? The rook. <laughs> Got to obey my own rules here. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you, Brian. Nice addition. Okay, what about this guy? Uh, let me see here. Ryan, are you with us? Yo, what up? Hey, can you, uh, you take a look at this puzzle and see if you can find where the loose piece is? We're playing for black, right? You're playing for black, so you're looking for white's loose piece. Oh, playing for black, good job. Yeah. Uh, burr, burr, burr. Uh, maybe that bishop down at a2, hey? Yeah, the bishop on a2, exactly. And we can also see, right, working with our theme, that the king on g1 is loose. So how do we, uh, how do we pick up some points here? Any idea? Oh, man. <laughs> Anybody want to help him out? That's fine. Let's go queen to a7. Queen to a7. Bingo, bango, dodge Durango. Oh, good shout. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Right? So as we go through this lecture, right, I am going to start looking at some of these more unusual angles, right, because um, I know that most of you are probably already familiar with the basic idea, right? So I am going to try and, and create some odd patterns and, and challenge you. I also expect this might be a little shorter than some of my previous lectures. Okay, white to, oh, excuse me, black to play, missing my own notes. Okay, so first things first, we got to identify a target. Brian Rodriguez, can you see where white has a piece that is undefended, a loose piece? I cannot, sir. Mm. I, I, I'm Rob? Sorry, I'm just oh, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, you mean the bishop on B4? Excellent. Yeah, the bishop is undefended, right? I, I was going to say that, but I didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair. But the, I'm happy it no, it's like. worse. I got to be honest with you. I think it's worse now. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were better off just, you know, digging in. <laughs> All good. Okay, so we've got the king on h2. We got the bishop on b4. How do we pick it up? Mm, let's go, Lenny. I know you can do this. Queen b8. Queen b8. Okay, so 
I like these puzzles. I'm always a big fan of these little moves, right? Because I find that sometimes the things that are not so dramatic can often be easier to miss, right? Harder to spot, I find. Um, there's one puzzle in here, I think, where the queen just goes from D1 just to E1, right? Right off the beginning of the game. Um, because I think the king had castled. And it's like those little tactics can often be the difference. Okay. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just if it's permissible, John, uh, to borrow from, uh, from Brian, and I know where, where I can stay, hold a candle to him, if in the last position you go rook e1. So you're looking, we're going back here? Oh, actually, I take it back because you're in check. You can't do it. I was just thinking that if you're yeah. you know, trying, to, trying for counterplay, and certain, but obviously in check, you can't do it. Right. Yeah. No, you know, that's um, actually hold those kind of thoughts, though, Bill, because um, I know for those of you who probably are feeling like this is old hat, right, I wanted to set the table and bring everyone along with us, but we're going to look at things that are at least a little bit more tactically complex. Um, although, you know, maybe not, uh, we're probably not going to stretch things too far today. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the benefit I guess I actually should have mentioned this. One of the reasons why when you're learning double attack, you should always start with the king and a loose piece as the targets is because the king makes it a lot uh, safer to execute your tactic, right? The odds of your opponent having a defense go way down when they're in check. Their, their number of options decline significantly, right? So um, as you saw, right, you... you tried to execute something which may or may not work, but unfortunately, right, it's uh, against them rules. Okay, last one on this theme, and then we'll, we'll move on to some other types of target and pattern. Um, this one is, again, black to play for no particular reason. Okay, so first things first, find the loose piece. Things are getting a little bit more crowded. G3 is undefended. So the knight on G3 is not defended. Very good. Very good. Anybody see how we can pick it up? Queen to G5. Queen to G5. King on C1. Knight on G3. Okay. And again, we win a piece. Okay, excellent. Very, very good. Okay, so I think we've thoroughly set the table there with king and loose piece. Right? Obviously, this is not the only kind of target that exists. So a slightly more complex version is when we have two loose pieces. Okay, well, in practice, this shouldn't be that different, right? It's the same idea of creating two targets for attack and they drop off. However, as I noted before, the significant difference lies in the fact that now there's no check. So, for example, I like looking at this incredibly simple example here because it's really easy to go wrong here. So, um, for example, if Neil, I was to play queen to c5 here, what could black play to kind of diffuse the whole thing? Uh, move the rook. Um to a6. So a6 isn't bad, but keep in mind I am still grabbing the bishop. So yeah, so b, b7. Exactly, uh, right? Not a6, but b7. And okay, you know, somebody might argue, but then I'll try that, right? Well, this isn't a game, right? This is <laughs> more just an exercise. As you can see, there aren't enough pieces to constitute anything real, right? But it demonstrates a good point, which is when you are now getting into two loose pieces, you have to have a few more considerations, right? The ability to counterattack and, and um, the ability to save both pieces um, because of the lack of a check, right? So these are slightly more difficult, although hopefully not, uh, hopefully not too much, right? So uh, we'll look at a couple of simple examples here. I'll actually gonna take the lead on the first one, right? So uh, we see that Black has sort of fractured his situation a little bit, right? A lot of pieces are exposed. I mentioned that at the top of the game, rooks are loose, 
Okay, we've actually seen this come up before, like when I had my uh, famous loose diagonal loss, right, and allowed myself to be forked over here, but that's going back to a lecture that was a few weeks ago. Okay, so we've got a loose piece on C5 and a loose piece on H8. Where does the queen belong? C3. Queen to C3, right, hitting the knight. Hitting the rook, we can't save both. Probably then black would respond with something like f6, right? And we win a piece and, you know, prevent our opponent from castling. Okay, not that uh, it's so safe over there anyway. Okay, excellent. Keeping things moving right along. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, uh, Charles. <laughs> Okay, both knights, yeah, bo both knights are loose, so you move the, the queen to e1 to attack both. Very good. A small move, but a powerful one, right? Okay, excellent. We're getting the, we're getting the feel here. Okay, very good. Okay, probably the most difficult one yet. We got the most things going on. But again, with a proper search strategy, no problem at all. Where are the loose pieces? And then find a way to get them. Is this five and four loose? <laughs> no, it's all right. Hey, Rob, why don't you go ahead? But is this white to move? It is. Yes. My apologies. No. I mean, I guess the the rook on a six is loose, and then yes. the knight on e four is vulnerable. I guess. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you, you could slide the queen over to d three. Bingo. Absolutely, right? Picks up a piece. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I know I'm not going very deeply into these things, right? Maybe black would play C4, right? And then we could pick up the knight. But uh, my main purpose here was just to introduce some tactical themes, right? Not so much to get into the games themselves. Okay. Uh, this is another one that is black to play. And uh, Andrew... If you can tell me where the pieces are loose, I won't put the pressure on you to find the solution. <laughs> For sure. So you've got your knight on um, uh, G4. Um, the H4, letters, yes. Four, sorry. Letters, I apologize. There. I apologize. And uh, then also the um, bishop on C2. Absolutely. However, I will and say... You also have the other knight too, yeah, D2. Yes, exactly. Yep. So then, right, it becomes... But that's very good, right? It's an extra detail. It, you know, one of the things that we talk about in chess a lot is this idea that um, a weakness is only a weakness if it can be exploited, mm -hmm. right? So um, we get into this all the time, and, you know, you'll see that actually suddenly realizing in a moment of inspiration might be next week's lecture. Um, you know, very often people get very dogmatic in chess, right? And, and they say, well, you know, he has a bad bishop or... He's got bad pawns, right? But if you're not in a position to take advantage of those weaknesses, it may not actually matter in the results of the game, right? And so this kind of misunderstanding leads to bad evaluations all the time, right? I thought I was winning in this line because he has bad pawns or some such thing, right? So here, to bring it back to our particular position, I would say the bishop is loose, right? I'm not going to argue over terms. But because of the difficulty in attacking it, it isn't yeah. really a problem. Whereas, right, these two knights, this one's on an open file and this one is on an open diagonal, right? Yeah. And relatively, um, not only that, but not really too well able to move, right? Mm -hmm. Because of being on the side of the board. These are the issues. So what could you play here as black? Sure, queen to d8. Exactly, right? I did give you a bit of a hint, I guess. <laughs> right, I'm sure it wasn't too hard. Okay, let's add a little bit of interest to this one, though. So, um, actually, in going over these and making sure there were no holes, right, so that uh, we wouldn't have too many problems with the teaching, I noticed that white has some ability to defend here, right? So, one idea would be, okay, so to first throw in bishop b3 check, because, uh, I mean... 
first of all, why not, right? Getting the bishop to a better square and winning with a check here. And after king to h8, does anybody see how I could try to maybe counterattack and avoid losing material here? It's not so easy, but I wanted to throw it in for those of you who are having an easy time. How can white try and save himself? Knight g6? Knight to g, uh, knight to g6, I think I'll just, uh, I'll just snap you off, right? And I'm up, I'm up that piece anyway. So I don't think that'll, uh, I don't think that'll do it. Counterattack is the key, right? We're How about, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. H4, F5. H, sorry, I'm just, oh, 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 like this? Oh, I, see. Oh, I, I, see. I just lose my piece right off the bishop. If the well, bishop hang on, no, 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 hang on, hang on. Don't, don't dismiss that too readily. What I would say is, there's a, there's a slightly stronger idea than that, but what you are pointing to, Bill, is something we haven't talked about, which is the idea of a desperado, right? Which, aside from being a great Jackson Brown song, um, is an idea in chess that we can use sometimes when we're going to lose a piece anyway, right? So the knight on h4 is up for grabs. It's not the worst idea to say, all right, well, getting a pawn is better than getting nothing, right? I can still um, tuck my knight back on f1 and then go to e3, right? Or something like this after he takes back. And if he takes this knight, well then this knight on f5 will be in a good position to maybe, you know, hack at the defenders around the king, right? I would love to swap off this bishop and create some uh, loose squares for counterattack, right? So I don't think that's not the idea I was looking for, but I don't think it needs to be quite so quickly dismissed. Does anybody see something else? It, it has to do with counterattacking and trying to simultaneously defend one of your knights and create a threat of your own. And I'll give somebody one more shot and then we'll keep things moving. Queen to d5? Queen to d oh, knights go backwards. Uh, rook a to d1? Rook a to d1. Okay, rook a to d1. Ah, rook a to d1 is sneaky. The problem with rook a to d1 is that maybe I think I can just save my queen and come over here. And now we do have this idea of g3, which I do love, but I think now either knight to h3 or even really cute queen to g5, and you notice that you cannot actually take the knight. Right? Okay, so... I will, I will relieve everyone. Um, the idea that the computer found, which I found interesting, was first this check and then actually g3 right away. Right? So you notice this knight on f4 is in take. And if knight to h3, king to g2. And the trouble is, you see, right, that we've saved our knight on h4 and the, rook on, uh, the knight on h3 is still loose. All right, black, however, is still preferred here, right? Takes, king takes, and if nothing else, I mean, as the computer's suggesting a5, but also, right, this, uh, this is a little scary. You know, the king is exposed and probably, you know, we can uh, continue to create attacking chances here. Um, and I think, you know, black is still getting the better of the play by quite a bit. But it's interesting that, you know, there is some complexity there that we don't have to lose the piece. Okay, we dove, we dove into some deeper waters there for a moment. Let's get back into the shallows where everybody's with us. Okay, so this idea, right, so far we've looked at two kinds of target. We've looked at loose pieces, we've looked at the king, okay, and we've looked at some combinations of those two, right? But now we're, we'll get into a third type which is the idea of a barely defended piece. Uh, now this one I, I find there's not enough said about, right? I have just, you know, noticed in my teaching and in chess books that I've read that very often they don't discuss this idea quite enough. So what is a barely defended piece? Well, a barely defended piece is a piece that is attacked exactly as many times as it is defended, 
So, for example, as a giveaway, right, this knight on c7 is defended, he's protected. So it might not set off the alarm bells in your head right away that this is a target, but we already have an attacker on that piece. So when you have one attacker and one defender, right, I mentioned this, I think, another day when I talked about this idea of twofold attack, right, two attackers attacking the same thing, which is very close but not the same as double attack, which is one attacker attacking two things, okay? There's a little bit of uh, uh, particular nomenclature there. But when we have one attacker and only one defender, in essence, the piece is still loose, right? Some sudden attack or change in the weather might make that piece drop off the board the same as ever. So here, we have the loose piece on c7, we've got the king on g7, and queen c3, and we win a piece again. Because, of course, after f6, right, we can take, we're not afraid of exchanging queens. Especially, and this gets into another thing that I want to do a lecture on, but um, we're especially not afraid of trading queens once we're already up material. Right? When, um, you can think of that as being like the principle of running the ball in football, right? For those of you who are into football, which, you know, I love. Um, you know, once you're... Once you have an advantage, you want to get the game over as soon as possible. So once you go up some significant amount, it usually makes sense to trade pieces. There are some complications to that and some subtleties, but that's a good rule of thumb for all of you to remember. Okay. All right. So these next few puzzles have to do with this idea of still finding the king as a target, right? But now our second target is a little more hidden rather than being loose it will be this barely defended. Okay, so again, we have a black to play. All right, um, the king is obvious, right, and probably helps in the solving of this a great deal. But what about our second target? Uh, Dave, let's get you back in. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. I, Excellent. My girlfriend's here too. Ah, very good. Thank you for coming. Um, damn, uh, I don't, uh, the, yeah, I know. Pocket could it be the queen, the bishop to the black queen to a, sorry, Jack, you can say it. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. Black queen <laughs> to a five. Yes, exactly. Right. So one thing that I want to make sure I, I underline for everybody is the key to solving these is where do you already have pressure? Right? Just like building any kind of good plan in life, you should start with, what do I already have? Right? We already have pressure on this bishop on f5, so it makes sense to try and take advantage of it in some way. Right? Queen a5 upsets the balance. He thought he had enough. He doesn't. Okay? <laughs> we pick up a piece. The king moves someplace, or you know, maybe knight to c3. Probably, I, I honestly don't hate just moving the king, even though I give up the right to castle because I want to keep this rook on the file anyway, right? And I, uh, you know, getting into something we'll get into later, I generally consider it bad form to self-pin, right? I do not enjoy putting myself in situations in which my, uh, you know, I'm already pinned and I chose to go there. So I think probably king to f1, and then bishop to f5, because why would I uh, trade queens when his king is less safe? But, uh, you know, maybe going to going up material, right? I could go that way too. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Dick. Okay. Um, okay, white to play on this one, right? Similar themes. Probably this one sticks out a little bit more because there's at least one black piece that looks very funny. And if you, you know, we are getting a bit of crosstalk today. Um, I will, I believe we should all have the option to uh, raise hand if you want. I do have the participant list up and we'll be monitoring it. So if you're worried about crosstalk, feel free to make use. Sorry, is it black to play? It is black to play, forgive me, yeah. Hmm. I like the silence. It means that I'm not, <laughs> I'm not making this too easy on all of you. 
Okay, so where do you already have pressure? What are you already attacking? I'm sorry. Did you say black to play? That is my fault. It is, it is white to play, forgive me. I, I knew that already and somehow said the wrong thing anyway. Okay. White to play, my apologies. With, with white to play, uh, queen to a four. Thank you, yes. So. Making a fool of me, I apologize, right? The knight is loose on h4. Yeah, I think uh, if black were to play, probably the best move is, if I had to guess, I would think probably just knight back to g6, right? Shoring up his weakness. But um, it's possible there might be some kind of nastiness here with f2 as well. But or knight going back, I mean, going back into the black, what about just the knight taking the pawn on g2 and putting him in check? Not... Certainly not terrible. So thank you. I'm actually glad we're looking at this because the problem that I have there is we pick up a pawn, but I'm a little worried about getting home. Right? Like, so after king to f1, oh, I guess, I guess just back to h4 is fine, right? And you know, you, Well, I suppose we still have this tactic in the hopper, don't we? <laughs> right? So I think, you know, that's one of the things that I, I like to watch out for with, um, with situations like that is – okay, am I going to get away with it, right? I mean, it's not a bad thing to want to steal a pawn, but you notice that black's really undeveloped, right? And I haven't castled. So the idea of trying to win the game outright when I'm breaking all of these principles, I get a little nervous about that, right? I sort of start to assume there's going to be some way I'm going to get in trouble, right? So I think probably I would, I would uh, even if the situation were slightly different, right? I mean, we know because of the specifics that this won't work out. But I think probably I would be really leery about trying to, you know, just go and blow them away. I, I have to be really careful and calculate that. Okay, moving right along. All right, white to play on this one. Again, where do you already have pressure? And again, it's white to play because now I'm paranoid that I've said the wrong thing. Um, the uh, the knight on c6. Yeah, the bishop is already hitting this knight, right? The bishop's already hitting this knight. So what can we do to upset the balance in our favor? One attacker, one defender, we need some help. Oh, queen to d5. Queen to d5, thank you, Neil. Excellent. Also, on the on the last yeah. one, could Black have played. Uh, no, White have played Bishop to G five. Going back to this puzzle. Yeah. Bishop to G five. Ah, Bishop to G five. I'm actually thank you. That's really helpful to look at that. This I do not like. This allows Black a really sneaky little trick. Oh. Okay, which is to remove the guard. Right, a different tactical theme, but something I think we've discussed, right? I can play now knight to f3, and the trouble is that it comes with check. So you have to resolve that check in some way, right? Say with queen f3 or uh, gf3, and now this bishop that looked so intimidating a mere moment ago <laughs> has lost his friend, right? And instead of uh, winning the game, we end up being the ones now under the gun, right? But thank you, that's an excellent question, right? The more we contribute, the better I think it helps everybody. Right, so very good. Yeah, so in this next one, queen to d5, right? And uh, there is no, no way to, um, there's no way to save the knight here, right? After this, you know, it, it looks tempting to try and make something work where we make the queen pay, but unfortunately your queen is still hanging on c7, right? So there is no... Uh, there's no option here to try and trap, right? It just doesn't work out. If you wanted to move the bishop, sorry to interrupt. No, bishop please, can... ask your questions. What do you got? From e4 to d5, as opposed to the queen to d5, what would that mm -hmm. look like? Well, so let's think about this in terms of theory, right? Rather than even, again, specifics are always important, right? We have to play the game of analysis, but I guess I saw today as being try and put the ideas into words. And what I would say is... Um, does that add another attacker, right? It maneuvers the bishop, 
but does it add any more pressure anywhere, right? I would say, right, okay, it hits the king, but after the king goes away, what have you really gained? You see what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's actually, you know, and, and to be honest, I would say, now here, because we know this Queen D5 move exists, it sort of spoils it, but I would say, you know, even just practically, when we're playing chess, if I have a check on the board, if my opponent has left this king out, and there isn't a loose piece, and there isn't a barely defended piece, and so there isn't some kill shot, what I would say is I will most of the time avoid making that check. Because sooner or later, my opponent is likely to create a second target. And when he does that, I want this check to still be on the board. Whereas if I make this check too early and my opponent moves his king, now that target's not around for when the other weakness appears. Does that make sense? 100%. Great. Right, yeah, this actually, I would relate this back um, to a few weeks ago, we looked at a different study, which I will not go back to the specific, well, you know what? <laughs> we looked at the specific uh, position in a Morphe game, right, where White had, created some threats. And we were looking at this pin, right? And the idea of this pin and how inconvenient it was because it tied the knight up, right? And this bishop actually later in the game ended up being, ended up being an enormous payoff. So although it's tempting, right, when you get into these situations to say, well, maybe I'll make a capture, right? Maybe I can do something by taking on f6. In reality, you're actually decreasing the inconvenience on your opponent, right? So you want to leave checks and leave pins and leave little inconveniences on the board as long as you can until you can find the concrete way to take advantage. Right? Otherwise, you're just kind of, um, you're just doing things because you don't know what else to do, right? And that's fair, right? Chess is a difficult game, but when you get into those situations, ask yourself, instead of, you know, taking this gun out of your own hands, so to speak, ask yourself, well, have I finished my development, right? Are my rooks connected? Is my king safe, right? Is there a piece that I can improve in a small way before I start exchanging these things off or making these checks, right? Okay, very good. So anyway, going back to our, our thing, okay. We have reached the final category um, for today, which is that of the checkmate square. Okay, so um, to recap, we've got the king, we've got loose pieces, we've got barely defended pieces. Okay, we've got um, anything worth more than the attacker, right, which I have actually, uh, I just realized not really looked at today, but I'll see if I can, shoehorn in an example okay and we've got a checkmate square so these are the five sort of major types of target that you can be aware of when you're looking for double attacks in particular but also i would say these come into play with pins and discovered attacks and skewers and many of the other tactical themes that we're not getting into so much so in this position very simple um, you know, and completely equal endgame, the sort of thing that somebody might try and offer a draw because they assume it's over. White has actually a really nice move here to win the game. Does anybody see what it is? White to play. King to b3. King to b3 is an excellent one. Thank you. Okay. So the idea, right, is we pick up the loose rook on a4, and you'll also notice that there is a checkmate threat. Right, the rook comes down to c1 and ends the game. And in fact, there is no way to save both. Okay? So even, even in an end game, and even when things look completely drawn, there can be these sorts of situations. This is, by the way, why sometimes you'll get into a situation like this against a stronger player, and they won't give you the draw. Because they are sort of still playing it out, hoping right, that you will fall into one of these kinds of traps. All right, a similar idea, relatively simple. 
um, we can see that there is a loose rook on a2. We can see that the king is a little bit shut in here, right? The knight is a little bit awkward on b7. It's one of the knight's kind of dumb squares where he can't, uh, can't get around quite so easily because of the awkwardness of the corner, right? And so here, white has the excellent move queen to c4. Okay, again, picking up the rook because the alternative is to allow yourself to be mated. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Something a little more challenging because it exists on a full board. Um, this is uh, still this idea of, well, I guess actually this is not an immediate mate, right? But it fits somewhere between the two categories of... Uh, of a loose piece and a key square. So this is black to play. And you can see that we're getting into, uh, you know, situations where there's a little bit more going on. So start with trying to identify the loose piece, right? And then find where else you have pressure. And I think that should, uh, that should do it. Okay, so we have the knight on c3, right, which is standing loose. Ah, Neil, thank you. Sorry, I can't tell people to raise their hands and then miss it. What do you got? Uh, is it queen to c4? Queen to c4. Queen to c4. I think, yeah, can I, can I just play this? Uh, yeah, I think... Not quite. So, okay, we've got the right first target, clearly. The key here is to recognize where else, where else do you have pressure? What else are you already attacking? So we've got the E2 square, right? But what else? What else, Brian? You're threatening F2. Some okay, thank you, Bill, right? Okay, so how do we combine the two? May, uh, uh. <laughs> well, I suppose you could, uh, maybe you could do a queen to f6. Yes, queen to f6, very good. You'll notice that almost all of these, right, I've invariably chosen examples with the queen today. Um, the knight is got to be one of the most famous <laughs> pieces for double attacks and is worth his own discussion, but I thought thematically it was best to stay consistent, right? for today, right? But um, obviously knight forks are one of the first ideas that people learn. But yeah, this queen to C uh, to F6 move hitting both F2 and C3, there's not a whole lot to be done here, right? I mean, maybe I can drop back, but that of course loses the piece on C3, right? And if I try and save my knight um, in any kind of way, well, actually, you know what? There is kind of an interesting thing here. That's a good play. I could play knight to E4, Okay, which maybe, by the rook. yeah, we can, we can actually sack. Oops, no, I don't want to do that. We can temporarily sack the exchange here because after bishop takes, I get my rook right back. Yeah. Right, with bishop f2. And I'm just going to, I'll end up up the piece that I exchanged an industry with. Okay. So that's good. I'm glad we're, uh, I'm glad we're getting to stump people a little bit. <laughs> And as usual, anyone who wants to write me, if they want to look through this lecture on their own, all you have to do is ask. Okay, this is one of my favorite examples because it is so simple. I mean, there are not a lot of pieces on the board, but a lot, now someone will get this immediately and, you know, spoil my fun, but most of my students take forever to figure out this puzzle. Okay, so, well, I, you know what? I'll give you nothing. <laughs> Black to play. <laughs> What should black play here? I 
with the easy, I mean, it's probably wrong, but I would like the queen, black queen to C from E, from D, G5 to C1. Uh, okay. That's, that's very simple. I mean, that's like a. Right, in, right. In but the idea of maybe with the idea of just exposing the king, right? And, and seeing what you can get from that. Yeah. I, you know, the, the weakness of the king here is part of it. So let me, let me give you something to start with here, which is this bishop on h3 qualifies as a BDP, oh. right? A barely defended mm -hmm. piece, right? You notice we already have pressure. Okay. So I find if we can recognize that, that, well, hey, you know, this piece is basically a loose piece because of the difficulty um, in defending it, right? That is the first element that we need to take into consideration. Now, the second element, sometimes this is another game I play with my students, is imagine that your queen could teleport. Imagine for a moment that you can cheat and put the queen on whatever square you want. What square, if the queen were there, would be checkmate immediately? If you could pick up the queen and just put it down, where would be checkmate? D1. D1. Bingo. Now, how do we combine these two ideas? Queen h5. Queen h5. Pick up the bishop. Threaten checkmate. Okay. Another one of these strange little sidestep puzzles, right? The queen does so little, and yet it commands the entire game. Okay, if he tries to exchange off, we made him. Okay. One of the unusual circumstances, by the way, in which um, the king can be mated without any assistance, right? Like the, the queen normally, when you're on an empty board, needs the assistance of the king, right? And you have to kind of work together. But if there's a single pawn, sometimes... Right, the queen can just kind of trap the king like this. The same pattern will work um, in the corner, right? If you shift everybody over, right, then you don't need this queen on g2. Okay, fabulous, fabulous. Um, well, I have, well, what the heck? <laughs> I was gonna stop there, but I do have, uh, I do have one game that if people are willing to stick around, I will go through at least some of, right? So this game that I'm gonna show at least a part of here is uh, my game against a 1900 player named Dennis Moore. Um, Dennis is a, a lovely gentleman and a fellow player at the Marshall Chess Club, but uh, I do not have his personal history for us today. But I had black in this game, and one of the things that I just wanted to show briefly, okay, without even necessarily getting through the whole thing, is Dennis plays this opening, which is incredibly common, called the Rui Lopez, okay? I think I've talked about the Rui Lopez before in our lectures, but if I haven't, um, the Rui Lopez, so named after the 15th century Spanish monk who first wrote the book on it, Right, is also known as the Spanish game. Um, it's one of the oldest openings in chess. It has an unbelievable amount of theory. I do not recommend playing this opening with knight f3 and bishop b5 to new players because you're really wading into something kind of encyclopedic. Right? But we're just going to look at, at sort of the beginning basic ideas here. So the idea of bishop b5 is very simple, which is to undermine to weaken the defense of e5, right? The game began with the establishment of the borders, right? Trench warfare, okay? White says, I would really like the whole center for myself. Black says, no, thank you. And then white seeks to undermine that defense, okay? But there's a really nice move here, which is kind of cool and something that I'm a big fan of and played then and now, which is to say, right? What's that saying? What was the Spartans? Mola Labe? Come and take them? Right? This move A6, which puts the question to the bishop immediately. And essentially says, look, if you want the pawn so bad, come and get it. And it turns out that black has a really nice defense here, right? Which is very important to understand if you want to play this opening. Okay? After bishop takes knight, we take back... Bill, we had a discussion many times about these kind of ideas, right? About taking back towards the center 
or taking back away from the center? Well, in the opening of the game, very often, we end up taking away from the center. Bill, do you remember why that was? I don't remember why that was, but it seems like you create a uh, file for the queen, but that's yeah. Right, development. Yeah, yeah. Because so development being more important than central control often in these open games, right? In these, um, in these classical positions. Okay, there are places where taking back towards the center, of course, is right, right? But here we have one of these exceptions because after knight to e5, coming back to the lesson, what can black play here? Queen e7. Queen e7 is okay. Queen e7, this is not the main move. I think, yeah, this might be good enough though. Queen e7 might be good enough. I guess I get like an extra move of development is all I was thinking because I can protect my knight. And now I think in order to get your pawn back, it looks to me like you have to maybe do something like play f6, right? Which I would prefer not to have to do, but this will work out right now. The pawn is loose and we can get our material back. There's actually a slightly more accurate move than queen to e7. Well, there's that big five. Sorry, Rob first. Well, from black, you you talking about black moving? Is mm -hmm. that where? Yeah, right. Exactly. White's white's taking our pawn, and I want revenge. Oh, the um. So let's think about targets, Rob. Think about targets. Right, we've got a loose piece on e five, and we've got a loose pawn on e four. How can I hit both? Well, the black queen could move to f. Six. F six is not bad either, right? Um, but not enough targets, right? So you've hit this, but this is not defined as a target because it's, yeah, right? it's defended well enough. So after knight to f three, I've escaped. See what I mean? It's a it's a queen move. You're absolutely right, but we need a different square. You've got to hit both these things. Queen to d four. There it is. That's the magic. Okay. And now something like knight to f3 to save, right, runs into queen e4 check. And black will actually emerge better from the open. Okay, because um, white is left with the unenviable choice of either queen e2, which, well, not that, goodness, right, allows the exchange of queens. Okay, and now we have an open position where black is not down any material because he got his pawn back and he has the bishop pair. Okay, so black will be very comfortable and have a, a very good game. Certainly not winning, but in the driver's seat, right? And white or, can't castle. Exactly. And even worse, now the castling is not quite as critical, I will say, without the, uh, without the queens on the board. But it, it matters a little bit, right? It, it will upset his development. And probably even worse is if they're stubborn and want to keep the queens on, Right. King to F1, I think, probably leads to even worse positions because now you can't castle and the queens are on the board. <laughs> so probably something like bishop E6 to avoid letting the queens come off, right, when white realizes his mistake. You know, play could continue something like this. I will castle queenside. I will have my rook on a central file, right? And life is really good for me. Okay, so that's just... Um, I guess an indication, kind of nodding back towards last week when we talked about knowing the typical tricks and playing as black, right? Understanding this double attack is really critical to being able to um, play the Rui Lopez successfully. Okay, I think actually that I will, I will cut it there. Um, the rest of this game does not thematically necessarily fit in. So I think I will save it for a future lecture. But uh, thank you all so much for coming. I know it's a little bit different than what I've traditionally done, but uh, I hope that it was interesting and educational. And um, I'm more than willing to stick around for a few minutes if anybody has any more questions. Um, I know that there have been plenty at the ends of sessions previously. Anything about today's lecture, but also just about playing chess, chess preparation, good books, really, you know, anything under the sun as long as it's about the 64 squares. So, John, in, with this board how it is right now, black to move, mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about queen to g6. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. So queen, yeah. queen to G5 is interesting, right? A lot of my students try this, and thank you for, for bringing this up. So this, this looks like it should be just as good, right? And I was hoping someone would suggest this. But unfortunately, this is actually a really bad move. And it works out to put black into a lot of danger. And I want to talk about why beyond just the specifics of the position. So the specifics of the position are that uh, the knight is defended. And so after you grab on g2, white now has the option of rook to g1. Right? And what you notice after the forced move queen to h3 is, okay, black's not immediately losing material, but white even though he has uh, equal material, right, he did not win a pawn, he has some significant advantage in development now building up, right? And so, you know, after something like rook to g3 even, right, kicking the queen again, okay, I think that white stands just fine here. He can take advantage of the fact that he has the center, right, and he can take advantage of the fact that he has um, some extra play. Right, actually, maybe even, um, let me just see here, maybe, is there something even more accurate? That's interesting. No, so yeah, I think, I think just not quite as accurate. And then the other thing that I wanted to talk about beyond the specifics, the other thing is that you've, in essence, by taking on G2, you've traded a G pawn for your E pawn. And in the great hierarchy of pawns that exists in chess, basically, as you move towards the center, you get more valuable, right? So, you know, if you have an opportunity to steal a center pawn and get away with it like this, it's probably worthwhile. Notice, like, going back to last week's lecture, white's going to have the option to maybe get this big pawn center with c3 and d4 that we've looked at both sides having. Right, so I don't think that's a trade positionally that you want to make aside from the development problem. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Right, no, of course, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. There is, I will say very, very quickly, there is a really cool trap that uh, actually can be played here. After bishop to c4, um, there is this gambit which is called the caustic gambit, right? Um, out of the opening where black plays knight to d4 here. And the right move is for white to actually swap knights because if they go for this move here, the extra firepower in the center now makes this incredibly scary. Okay, and a few of my students have lost games horribly because of things like, oh, I'm right, I'm winning the game, I have this awesome fork, right? But after queen to g2, you notice without the knight on f3, okay, suddenly none of these ideas that you have work, okay? So now, uh, well, let's see. So how could we lose in horrific fashion? I mean, we could try and save our rook, right? At which point, um, a beautiful combination. <laughs> queen e4, right? And queen e2, right? Followed by this guy. Or my personal favorite, here's the beautiful combination. Let me turn off the engine so it doesn't give us any indicators. Okay, let's say we play bishop e2 to avoid losing the uh, to avoid losing the queen. Does anybody see what black does here? Uh, knight to f3. Yeah, whoops. <laughs> Bishop's pinned. That's game over. Right, so, um, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable way to play. And actually, even if, if white takes the knight, Black can at least get a somewhat reasonable position. So those of you who are looking for some fun here and making this queen g5 move work, right, the, uh, the caustic is, is pretty entertaining. Okay, so there, there's an example where it works very well um, because there's no knight on f3, right? And if there were, of course, we have options to trade him off. Okay, any other questions? Just in general. John, oh, go ahead. John I got to run, man. I love you, dude. Um, and I'll see you next time, okay? Thanks for coming, Dave. Appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye, Bye. Yes, Bill. John, I'm forever hanging pieces and leaving loose pieces around. Ought I to be trying to play in general with one piece or another? Obviously, when you're going to move a pawn, mm -hmm. ten, I mean, you, there's the issue of sacrifice, which is a whole different battle. 
um, should I try to play otherwise with avoiding undefended pieces? In other words, trying to play in positions where I can easily defend? Yes, I would say 100%. Look, solving tactical puzzles, I find, has the subtle effect of changing your psychology anyway, right? And so very often the best way to fix some of these things is to just work on the patterns. But I will say in slower games, right, in slower classical time controls, when we have time to think about our own thought process and examine it, right, defer to moves that keep your pieces secure. Very often, right, there's a concept that we haven't looked at very much, but which is called overprotection. That is kind of this exact idea, right? Essentially, when you have no other active plan that immediately presents itself, or if perhaps there's no hurry for your active plan, because sometimes in closed positions, we don't have to outrace our opponent, right? We have time to move strategically. Just guard your stuff. Just make sure that it's all safe and secure, right? You could do a lot worse because so many of these tactics are floating around all the time. And if you just wait, very often your opponent is going to start committing these weaknesses. This is especially true if your opponent's very aggressive, right? They tend to not be thinking about defensive shots. And so they're coming at you with all their pieces and everything's hanging and one sudden well-placed queen check, right? And now they have to try and attack you short one more piece. So yeah, absolutely, I think it's useful for your psychology to, to think about these things. And I think you find that grandmasters even are very often doing these sorts of things. Um, one similarity, you know, very often when white castles queenside, you'll see white spend a move at some point during the game to just play king to b1, right? And the whole purpose of that move is number one, very often to get off of some of these sensitive, right? Because the D pawn's often been moved. So there's these sensitive diagonals and files. But the other reason they're doing it is because after they castle, right? The rook will no longer be guarding A2. So they're just bumping the king over to make sure that that square is protected so that later there isn't some nasty double attack that they didn't plan on. You know what I mean? Anyone else? I have a question, John Harden. Yes. So uh, for an um, inexperienced player who's you know, on their road up to 1,000 or something like that, yeah. how important do you think it is to play around with different kinds of systems? Because mm -hmm. hypothetically, the systems are there to make sure you're not hanging stuff out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, what do, you, what do you think about that? Um, so here's what I would say. My, my attitude on openings, well, first of all, I am very much a do as I say, not as I do person because I spent a lot of my earlier years, actually, uh, Lenny Shogun, with whom I spent an awful lot of time practicing chess many years ago, can back me up on this, that I spent a lot of time learning how to play openings. Um, and I don't play any of those openings anymore, and I can't remember most of what I learned. Um, so... I would say that um, investing too much time in memorizing and learning the ins and outs of openings is very often counterproductive because, um, for example, what happens when your opponent plays a move that's not in your book? What do you do then? And you will frequently find that people will do that on move three, right? They won't do it on move 11 when, okay, that's fine because I got 10 moves of good theory and it was very useful, right? They'll do it on move three and you might as well chuck the book uh, in the garbage, right? It's not going to help you. Um, now, to be a little more constructive, when you're learning openings, what I recommend always is to pick something, right? Sometimes you can get some guidance on this, right? I, I try to make suggestions and YouTube videos are very helpful so that you can look around but try and pick something and stick to it. Because the more that you play the same thing over and over again, the more you will start to learn the typical tactics and the typical problems. And you will avoid the problem of the student who changes openings constantly, who is making all sorts of different mistakes all the time, and as a result, can't build any experience, right? Later, after you've reached, right, post a thousand, something like that, Ryan, 
you can absolutely diversify to learn different pawn structures and different plans. I think that's great. But when you're just trying to get acquainted with the game, pick an opening, stick to it, and then find better players so that you're forced to learn those lessons, right? Don't just play the same people over and over where you're winning the game all the time and, and as a result, not being pushed.